Greetings from the historic Wendover Airfield. Welcome back for our fourth installment of our live history lessons. I'm Landon Wilkie, the museum curator. So as we go throughout this um, video, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to throw them out here and our cameraman, Jim, who is also the museum director, will throw those out to us so we can try to answer and at the end we'll also offer a question and answer session if anyone's interested. But today we're talking about um, heavy bomber training. Um, Windover was very much involved in that. So our three previous episodes are kind of culminating in this um, topic today for heavy bomber training because we talked about the flying clothing that goes into it, aerial gunnery training, as well as the Norden bomb site and bombardier training. So of course there's a whole lot more that would go into heavy bomber training, but we're hoping to in the next few weeks kind of change up our topics. So this is just to give you an overview of um, kind of what we've talked about previously. So Windover Army Airfield, or the base here, was first started as a sub post of Fort Douglas to supplement the bomber training that was going on um, on the bombing range between pretty much here and the Great Salt Lake. It was a millions of acres of bombing range that the federal government had. But in June of 1941, the Army Air Force was created, and so they realized that as they were getting up to speed as an autonomous Air Force, that they really had to figure out um, what they needed as far as combat crews. We're going to have an airplane coming in here in a second, so we can pan to that for a second so you can watch something more interesting than me. But, <clears throat> yeah, the Army Air Force had to had a major demand for equipment and manpower as they realized that we were going to be going to war in the near future. So in March of 1942, this base here became an independent Army Air Base, and it was opened for heavy bomber training. So what that means is we were going to be training a lot of B-17s and B-24s. And we bring you out here because this hangar one that you see is one of the one of four hangars that we have like this. During our heavy bomber training period, we had um, four of these hangars and two larger hangars that were used for the same purposes. But these hangars, where these doors open, is 120 feet wide. So a B-17 had a 104 foot wingspan, and a B-24 had a 110 foot wingspan. So there was not a lot of wiggle room to get these planes in and out of there. So we're going to make our way into the hangar to get away from some of these sounds. And we'll continue talking. So the typical heavy bomber group consisted of 72 aircraft. So imagine we only have four hangars that can fit one aircraft. There's a lot that's going to have to go on. So these hangars were, are called squadron maintenance hangars. So this is where they would really pull in airplanes for major overhauls. Otherwise, most of the basic repair work was done out here on a ramp that you were just seeing as that airplane pulled in, or even down taxiways, depending on how many aircraft we had. So here you can see the interior of one of these hangars. And in Windover, I mean, it was either hot or cold, depending on the time of year. So they did have a few Airmen could also warm their hands, but it was not a comfortable place to be ever. You can see there's lots of windows for light, and a few of those actually cracked open so they could try to catch a nice warm desert breeze when it was hot. But this gives you an idea of um, some of the circumstances that these guys were working in. So we're going to make our way in front of our one of our visiting aircraft here. And we'll show you some pictures to talk about heavy bomber training. But, <clears throat> so before the war, just to mention it, the main way that training was done is people would graduate from their flying schools or whatever their was. Maybe we'll have to... We'll try to get some pictures for you, but here's a picture of a B-17 coming out of one of these squadron maintenance hangars. 
four training um, pretty much consisted of these people finishing up their um, training like pilot school or navigation school and then they would just be plopped in the middle of an active group and they were expected that group was expected to give them their advanced training so before the war when there wasn't a lot going on and there was and then we have down the taxiway even more airplanes parked on hard stands out there so this gives you an idea of the scope of logistics that they had to deal with here we have a little video that shows probably a complete group of B-17s with a lot of the crew standing in front of their aircraft for review. So just imagine trying to manage all these individuals and getting them ready so that they are a competent fighting team when they get to combat. So the pre-war training ideas weren't going to work and in the early days as they were trying to figure that out a group would ship out to combat, say to Europe, and as they lost crews, whether because um, their tour of duty was up or they were shot down, then <clears throat> they were pretty much just allowed to pull anyone from stateside training bases, which then left holes in training regiments. So that wasn't going to work either. So we had, um, in Britain at the time, some American observers seeing what RAF Bomber and Fighter Command were doing. Because, of course, they were already in this war for a couple years prior to us and were trying to keep Germany at bay with constant flights day in and day out. Um, <clears throat> so what the Royal Air Force had in store was called operational training units and replacement training units. And this is essentially what, beginning in 1943, the Army Air Force actually adopted. So I don't know. So what would happen, actually, let me go to this picture real quick for you. So what would happen is, you see you have all these different kinds of air crew. We have pilots, we have bombardiers, radio operators, flight engineers, gunners. Then you have administrative staff, ground personnel. All of this goes into making a competent fighting combat group. So what would happen is all these individuals would do their, in, their own personal specialized training and then upon graduation, they would be brought together at a base like Windover, an operational training base or a phase two training base. And this is where that group would be put together, where the squadrons would be put together, and where these men would be put into, the, into their bomber teams of nine to 11 men, depending on the aircraft. So this is um, what they figured out and how the war was going to progress. So just to give you some better ideas of the logistics of what they had to figure out, this is a representation right here in the front of air crew. And then right behind them we have our uh, crew chief and his maintenance team. So that's about how many uh, maintainers were needed to keep one of these bombers flying day in and day out. And then behind them we have all of our other specialties. We have armorers who are going to load the bombs in the aircraft. We have people who specialize in propellers, radios, electronics, um, superchargers, etc. And back here we have, of course, gas supply. There's a lot of fuel going in these planes. We have oil supply. And then we have back here as an example of administration, people like the meteorologists and the dispatchers that are actually going to get these guys in the air. And this is kind of a similar representation with those different groups that are going to get them off the ground. And this one adds, just in case they crash back on the ground, we have a wrecker to pull planes out. We have our medics on standby as well as our firefighters should something go awry. So you can just imagine how much is going into a typical group. There's typically about 2,200 individuals per Army Air Force group. So what happened at one of these operational training bases was three phases. The first phase was these folks would um, continue practicing their own specialized um, position. So that's why if you come out and visit us, you'll see different buildings like our Norden Bombsite building, our Bombsite trainer building. We used to have celestial navigation training buildings so that our navigators could hop in those and figure out how to plot courses by the stars, etc. And of course our pilots and gunners are still out there honing their skills. And then the second phase, that was kind of starting to show that, um, 
these guys are put together as their actual teams. They're learning how to operate together. They're learning what everyone is doing in sync on the aircraft and what they need to do to keep their bomber in the air. So there we can see some sort of group. I don't know to what extent, but this would be air crew and ground crew that we see standing on the wings of this B-17 in front of one of the hangars that we're actually in. So I just want to go back to this video just to show this part again, but the third phase of operational training was to make sure the entire group that the guys will really need to make it through combat. So then there's the question of, we have a group that's just finished training. So here they find themselves in, say, Europe. Now air crews are starting to meet their um, tour of duty limits of 25 to 35 or 40 missions, depending on where you are. Or, more often than not, these air crews are being shot down. So we have to find replacements to get people back into these groups. So the alternative to operational training units was replacement training units, of which Wendover did have several of. So these are formed in the same way. These people just finished their training around the country, say pilots from Texas working on four-engine bombers, or navigators from, I don't know, Kansas, etc. They all come together at a and then they go through all the same training except for that final phase where the group has to be able to work together competently so they can ship out together. Instead, these air crews are going to be um, parted out and fill in those gaps in combat zones. So, just to kind of emphasize the amount of teamwork and basically the brotherly bond that these air crews got, I want to introduce just this story of an aircraft called the Star Valley. So Sergeant Wilford Henniger here was a tail gunner on one of these B-24s. And during training on 23rd September 1943, somehow he got tangled up in his tail turret apparatus and was actually strangled to death. Now as soon as the crew members realized that he was in trouble, the crew attempted to get down on the ground as fast as possible, but unfortunately the medics were not able to do anything for him. Um, Sergeant Henniger had passed away. So in tribute to how close they were as a bomber crew, the rest of the crew actually went to Star Valley, Wyoming, where Henninger was from, to pay their last respects for him, as well as his family and his um, community. And because of that, in tribute, as they shipped off to combat just a few months later, they named their B-24 the Star Valley in honor of the community they met, as well as their friend, Sergeant Henninger. And unfortunately, just a couple months later on um, the 5th of February 1944, they were shot down over France, and all but one of the crew was killed. But that shows you how close they were. I mean, they were risking their lives every single day, whether it was in training or combat. So that's why this was so important to be able to form these basically family bonds as they went through this training. And something people don't a lot of times, even these crews wild, often they were their only support group for one another. So there was so much wrapped up into this. But just to end with how John Steinbeck uh, kind of described this, he said, each man has been thinking in terms of specialty, but now each will begin to think in terms of the mission. The word mission will change its meaning. Mission is the end toward which we have been working. So. Here at the end, these guys have formed that close bond. They've learned how to work together as a group. And now their final goal is that mission, to go out and be able to be successful in these strategic daylight bombing campaigns, which they were training for. So I think we'll end with that, mainly because of our poor connection there. But we just want to let you know that we do have some new items up on our um, gift shop website. So if you visit us at windoverairbase.com and visit our online PX link, you can see we have all of our current shirts up there, as well as we have a lot of new embroidered and um, bags with the historic Windover Airfield logo. And we're trying to get more up there uh, every day. So if you wouldn't mind supporting us, especially during this time where we can't have you come in our doors, but 
thank you for your support and we hope to see you in the future for a tour so you can see inside of this hangar. <laughs>